Before Elvis Presley was dubbed the king of rock and roll, before his gyrating hips and black sounding music scandalized white America, before Frank Sinatra threw shade in Elvis's direction. As a matter of fact, what you seem to have lost is your sideburns. Before his massive weight gain, drug abuse, and rhinestone covered stage costumes would make a clear divide between young Elvis and fat Elvis. Before Eminem would pick up where Elvis left off. Before Graceland, Elvis's home for 20 years, became one of the most visited homes in America, attracting over 600,000 visitors per year. Elvis grew up in the Deep South, where his family would survive an F5 tornado in 1936. His father struggled to pay the bills, so much so his financial problems would land him in jail. Elvis would then be raised by his mother, and well, he was a shy kid who got bullied often, he was a bit of a loner. His early musical influences included Hank Snow, Roy Ackoff, Ernest Tubb, Ted Daffin, Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Davis, Bob Willis, Jake Hess, and sister Rosetta Tharp. Shortly after high school, Elvis was packaged as a white musician who could bring black music to white audiences, but after achieving unparalleled success in the music industry and more than a decade of movie stardom, Elvis would struggle with prescription drug addiction, weight gain, and, well, a turbulent love life. What's going on guys, my name is Michael McCredden and welcome to Before They Were Dead, documenting the life and career of Elvis Presley prior to his passing here for you on Before They Were Dead. Feel free to leave your condolences in the comments down below. Also, let me know who you want me to document next. Now, not a lot of you guys requested this video. In fact, it was my mother and my aunt who wouldn't stop asking for it. So, this one, I'm dedicating to them. All right, guys, let's roll that intro. Aaron Presley was born on January 8, 1935 in Tupelo, Mississippi in a two-room shotgun house built by his grandfather. His identical twin brother, Jesse Garen Presley, was delivered stillborn 35 minutes prior. As a result, Elvis was the only child of his mother Gladys Love and his father Vernon Elvis Presley. Elvis' ancestry was mainly Scottish, Irish, German, and French. On top of this, his mother's great great grandmother may have been Cherokee Native Indian, but I got a feeling there was a little more to that than they wanted us to know, and someone swept that whole thing under the rug. You catch my drift? Did I just start some Elvis conspiracy? Uh, let's get back to the facts. Elvis, he grew up poor. Some would say he grew up in the ghetto. Now his father Vernon worked a long string of odd jobs and the family relied on government food assistance and help from neighbors to get by. In 1938, Vernon was found guilty of check fraud and was jailed for eight months. The family, they lost their home and Gladys and young Elvis were forced to move in with relatives. He found his initial musical inspiration at church but was a shy loner and he preferred not to sing in public. But when he was 10 years old, he was encouraged to enter a singing contest by one of his teachers, and he placed fifth. Yeah. A few months later, he got his first guitar for his birthday, but he wasn't too happy about it. He was hoping for a bike or that of a rifle. Uh, my editor told me I should stop saying that of, so he's hoping for a bike or a rifle. In 1948, the family moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where they would live in a rooming house for a year before getting a two bedroom apartment in a public housing complex called Lauderdale Courts. Elvis attended L.C. Humes High School and he received a C in music in the 8th grade. Yeah, I know. One of his music teachers told him he had no aptitude for singing and he was often bullied by his classmates who saw him as a mama's boy. While Elvis remained shy about performing in public, his neighbor, Jesse Lee Denson, began giving him guitar lessons in 1950. They and three other boys, included Dorsey and Johnny Burnett, performed a loose musical collective that often played. Around this time, he would also frequent Beale Street, the heart of Memphis, then thriving blues scene, and he would also spend a lot of time in record stores, listening to a wide variety of musical genres, including blues, country, southern gospel, and, of course, rhythm and blues. By the time Elvis graduated high school in 1953, he had decided that his future would be in music. That summer, he went to the offices of Sun Records to record a two-sided disc as a gift for his mother. After he recorded, the head of Sun, Sam Phillips, asked the receptionist to note the young man's name. Elvis's career didn't pick up right away. He auditioned for several bands, but no one was interested in hiring him as a singer, so he worked as a truck driver to pay the bills. While Sam Phillips was already on the lookout for someone who could bring the sound of black musicians to a broader audience, and reportedly had this to say. If I could find a white man who had the Negro sound and the Negro feel, I could make a billion dollars. Lo and behold, Sam thought Elvis Presley could be that man. 
He invited Elvis to record with guitarist Winfield Scotty Moore and bassist Bill Black. The recording session didn't go very well and then late in the evening, well everyone was getting a little restless. That's when Elvis Presley took out his guitar and launched into a rendition of Arthur Crudup's That's Alright while jumping around and acting the fool. The band followed suit and Sam liked what he heard. He's later a popular Memphis DJ Dewey Phillips played the recording on his Red Hot and Blue show. Listeners called in to ask who the singer was. With the interest the song was generating, he played the song several times during the last two hours of his show. With the positive feedback, Elvis and his band went right back to the recording studio to record Blue Moon of Kentucky in the same style as a B-side for That's Alright. While growing more comfortable on stage, Elvis was a little nervous when playing live shows. A combination of the adrenaline rush and the rhythm led to him shaking his leg while he performed. Well, although some people thought it was ludicrous, young women, they loved it and they would shriek in excitement. Well, that story there, it debunks what played out in Forrest Gump in which Elvis learns his moves from a young four and appeared on CBS's stage show on January 28th, 1956, exposing his scandalous, gyrating and unique sound to a national audience. His self-titled debut album featuring blue suede shoes was soon to follow. Then appear on the Milton Barrel Show and Steve Allen Show and the Ed Sullivan Show. Hits like You Ain't Nothing But A Hound Dog and Love Me Tender had crowds going wild. End of the year, Elvis Presley's merchandise had brought in 22 million on top of his record sales. He had more songs in Billboard's Top 100 than any other artist since records were first charted. And over half of RCA single sales were Elvis's songs. This time, it was tears of joy. Cause her young boy, he had done good. But not everyone was a fan of Elvis. Frank Sinatra was one to call rock and roll brutal, ugly, degenerate, and vicious. Fortunately for Frank, although Elvis received a deferment from service to finish one of his early feature films, King Creole, he would soon take a break from the spotlight to join the US Army. Now while enlisted in the army, Elvis would still record music while on leave. The army introduced him to karate, which he would later include in his live performances. And while stationed in Freiburg, Germany, he met a then 14 year old girl named Priscilla Beaulieu who he would eventually go on to marry in 1967, and they would welcome their daughter, Lisa Marie, the following year. After two years in the army, Elvis returned home as famous as ever and focused on expanding his celebrity from rock star to movie star. While he starred in four movies during the 1950s, he made 27 in the next decade. Nearly all of them, well, they followed the exact same format, but they still went on to make a huge amount of cash. Most of these musical comedies, they would be accompanied by equally formulaic and profitable soundtracks. By the end of the decade, his record sales began to wane, and Elvis was generally seen as a has-been. At that time, he would have ended up on an After They Were Famous, but come on guys, we're talking about the king. Around this time, Elvis started to perform in all leather, and the costumes, well, they would only get more and more out there. In 1970, he met with then President Richard Nixon at the White House, where he talked about his patriotism and contempt for hippies and the counterculture. He even put the Beatles on blast, despite the fact that he regularly performed their songs in concert all the time. In the 70s, his marriage to Priscilla was falling apart. The pair, they divorced in 1973, and this was only one of Elvis's personal problems he was dealing with. He also had weight gain and a growing addiction to prescription medication. That year, he overdosed twice. He was also hospitalized for drug-related health problems and spent three days in a coma in his hotel suite. Although Elvis was performing more often with each passing year, his health and drug problems were obvious to everyone around him. Keyboardist Tony Brown remembers Elvis falling to the ground when getting out of his limousine. Guitarist John Wilkinson recalls him performing so high on prescription medication that he could barely speak. In 1976, Elvis broke up with Linda Thompson, the mother of Brody Jenner, FYI, who he had started dating shortly after his divorce. He then began dating Ginger Alden, who he proposed to after only two short months. His weight and drug issues continued to be a problem, and his health deteriorated rapidly. At this point, he was suffering from glaucoma, high blood pressure, liver damage, frequent migraines, and an enlarged colon. On August 16, 1972, at the age of 42, Elvis collapsed and was found unresponsive on his bathroom floor by Ginger Alden. He was rushed to Baptist Memorial Hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 3.30 p.m. The world wept. Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. Apparently, it was a heart attack. Now, there are a few people who were alive during this time who cannot recall where they were when they heard this tragic news. Immediately, hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of people rushed to Memphis, Tennessee to attend the funeral and mourn Elvis's loss. Pandemonium has broken out here on Elvis Presley Boulevard in Memphis. 
Thousands of fans from all over the country are converging on Graceland, trying to get in to view the body of the 42-year-old king of rock and roll. And the rest of the story will lives on in his music, because this is before they were dead. Elvis has left the building. Please feel free to leave your condolences in the comments down below. My name is Michael McCrudden, and thanks for checking out Before They Were Dead. On this channel, we also do Before They Were Famous, After They Were Famous, and I'm planning on doing a new series after they were dead. And for Elvis, there's so much to work with. I mean, there's a bunch of men out there who like to dress up like him today. Then of course, Las Vegas. That place is a shrine to Elvis, as is Memphis, Tennessee. Some people still think he is alive today. I could talk about all that in After They Were Dead. Let me know if that's a video you want to see. Also, Aunt Gibby and Mom, I hope you enjoyed this one, because it was for you. I'll see you guys in another video. Woo!